Good morning. I'm Ken Goldstein. I'm uh, chair of the Board of Selectmen. I have with me my uh, brother and sister board members, uh, Selectman Wyshynski, Selectman DeWitt, Selectman Daly, and Selectman Franco. And thank you all for coming out so early. I hope you have a cup of coffee or, or uh, whatever your favorite warm <coughs> beverage is. As you know, the Board of Selectmen is considering placing on the ballot for the Springtown elections a proposed override to address our school enrollment issue primarily. And uh, this need has been advanced because of a marked increase in school enrollment. Since 2006, school population has grown by nearly 22%, about 1,250 students. And this trend appears to be only increasing at this point. Uh, in 2003, the Board of Selectmen formed an override study committee to make recommendations on the problem. And in their final report, the committee was nearly equally, equally divided into two groups. The first group proposed a $5 million override and a $1.6 million debt exclusion. Group two proposed a $7.9 million override and a $4.1 million debt exclusion. Uh, and I'll tell you now that uh, while those recommendations will be highly uh, persuasive to the Board of Selectmen and will, will certainly be strongly taken into consideration as a, as a proposed override is, uh, is addressed, they are not necessarily the numbers that we will be working with, uh, nor is it uh, to be assumed that there will be an override question at all. So uh, at this point, we are uh, still discussing. We want to hear from, from you, the <laughs> constituents of the town. We want to hear the pros, the cons, and what's important to everybody here. So uh, without further ado, I see that uh, we've got a sign-in sheet, and uh, I want to take as many comments as, as possible. Uh, it's a big room, obviously, a lot of people here. We got, um, um, you know, can't, can't go all day on this. So. I'm going to ask the people to limit their, their comments to about three to five minutes. And what I'm going to do is hold up my hand when, you've done, when you're at three minutes, so you know you've done three minutes, and then I'll hold up my hand five minutes, which is also stop at the same time. <laughs> so uh, um, thank you very much. Anything from board members before I begin? Thank you. Uh, first person on my list is Min Song. So, and after Min Song, Maya French, you're next. Maya, if you want to like just come and uh, line up by the window. I'm always going to try and announce the next person. Thank you, Mr. Song. Thank you. My name is Min Song. I'm from Nine Bradford Terrace. I'm going to start by just saying some of the most obvious things. Brookline Public Schools are physically in bad shape. Many schools are aging and they're overcrowded. Devotion, Pierce, and Driscoll need to be renovated. And they may need, even need to grow in size but obviously, it's a bad idea for them to grow too much. I believe that devotion should never grow larger than 1,000 students, and even 1,000 feels to me outrageously large. There's no way we can expand in place to accommodate the growing student population without compromising the quality of our schools. We obviously need a nine school to meet our expanding student population. We also need to pivot as quickly as possible to improving the high school, which is also physically getting old and crowded. And finally, while we're doing all of these things, we need to make sure we do not, new, we do not lose sight of what makes our schools excellent despite the physical limitations. I'm thinking of the teachers and staff who work so tirelessly and with such dedication to educate our children. In addition to being a parent and a homeowner, I'm a tenured English professor who, takes a lot of, who does a lot of administrative work. And in this role, I've thought a lot about the cost of higher education. Why are tuitions so high? This is a complicated question, to say the least, and I can't answer it here. But there's a couple of points that deserve highlighting. Number one, many colleges and universities have invested heavily in recent years in infrastructure development. New classrooms, new sports facilities, new dorms, and so forth, and these projects cost a lot of money. Number two, much of the teaching at the university level has become deprofessionalized. Many part-time teachers are now teaching undergraduates than ever before. Luckily, all the evidence we have suggests that this hasn't hurt the quality of education because the teachers are extremely dedicated and skilled. But we're fast approaching a limit to how long we can maintain this trend. If I've learned anything in the 17 years I've been a professor, it's that education, by its very nature, requires a lot of labor. 
that labor is highly skilled and it doesn't come cheap. You might be able to skimp in the short term, but in the long term, whatever you try to do to save money on labor comes back to haunt you. In the long term, there is no way to reduce this amount of labor without reducing the quality of the education students receive. And this axiom is true for grade school as it is for college. What this means is that we can't just focus on infrastructure. We have to make sure we allocate enough money to keep and attract the best teachers and staff we have. And this means logically, anyone interested in the quality of Brook Brookline's public schools should advocate for their larger override. But I hesitate to advocate for the larger override when the school expansion committee at Devotion uh, voted to recommend the most expensive option, option one, uh, which ranges anywhere between one and one and thirteen million dollars more than the least expensive or the less expensive options. If you look at the figures that were presented at the September 26 meeting, what you find is that the architects say option one will be about 118.5 million dollars, not 110 million, 118.5, and that figure feels to me too low. One of the big uh, uh, unpredictable costs in this is the 1913 building. Someone said before that it would require uh, that it would be at least 20 million dollars to renovate, maybe more. How much more? How much are we actually talking about? We know how much renovation. Uh, we have no idea how much actually option one will cost. Uh, however, if we were to do something that wasn't explored, which was to knock down the existing building and move to uh, building a new building, it would be a lot cheaper uh, and we would eliminate that undecided factor. So if I may, I just want to make four quick points before I run completely out of time. Well, you, you have run out of time, but please make it very quick. Uh, thank you. I want to say one, that we should vote for the larger override. Two, we should prioritize the reduction of con construction costs as much as possible, which means taking option one off the table and exploring more serious ways of uh, finding a more cost productive and less expensive alternatives. We should put firm limits on how large a school can get and we should make sure to dedicate as much of our time and as much of our funds as possible to maintaining and attracting the best teachers and staff we can find. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maya French, uh, Sundar, you're next. Can we, um, can I just Take one second to uh, to explain to people that we are contemplating both an uh, operating budget override and a capital override. The capital override is what would be for um, the the building at Devotion School, but there there would actually be two separate votes on a ballot. They would not they would not be a single vote. Go ahead. Thank you, Maya. Um, thank you. I think I and I. Um, both go to funding, and I think we're concerned about uh, fiscal responsibility, and I appreciate men's points. Um, thank you for your commitment to our town, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Maya French, and I, my home is in Precinct 8. I'm here to tell you both my husband and I support a larger override um, or debt exclusion uh, that will allow the town to address infrastructure and enrollment issues at all of our schools if fiscal discipline is exercised and public input is valued. That said, I'm disappointed and concerned about the $1.7 million spent on a feasibility study related to the Edward Devotion School and the resulting schematic design that improperly identifies option one as a community endorsed design. Indeed, the design evaluation process was flawed because the community was not given a meaningful opportunity to evaluate options that did not include the 1913 structure and a new building only on the Devotion property. There was no public hearing that would record or accurately reflect our community's view. This is troubling and may imperil the town's ability to obtain funding and support for an override. The town meeting approved the expenditure of $1.7 million for a building feasibility study to consider the renovation of devotion or the possibility of building a new devotion almost two years ago. My husband and I were delighted. Indeed, we know the Edward Devotion School well, and the current facility is in desperate need of attention and stable, committed leadership. Our son spent eight years at Devotion, and our daughter is in her seventh year. We have been active in the Devotion community in many different ways, from fundraising activities for educational grants to participating in events that build our community's identity. 
We've also helped with the Edward Devotion Garden, which has been incorporated into some of the school's curriculum. The Devotion property abuts our property, and we are at this time happy neighbors. I have attended renovation meetings and was hopeful for an outcome that would include an innovative, creative design that incorporated the wishes of our community. I knew then and now that any renovation or new building would have to be grounded in a financially responsible budget to obtain townwide support and funding from the state. I attended the September 26, 2014 meeting to reiterate my hopes and participate in that process, but the Devotion Building Committee refused public participation. It is ironic that this meeting produced what is now inaccurately characterized as the community endorsed or preferred option. I was dismayed. What resulted was even more surprising, a non-unanimous vote for a bigger version of the existing design that is the most expensive design option. You may already know this option uh, proposes construction that will most certainly go beyond the $110 million estimate provided to you at the override committee. It seems odd that we as a community repeatedly express the need for fiscal responsibility and a desire to spend our resources carefully. In spite of that refrain, the committee selected the most expensive design to build and maintain. Moreover, it is the most dis difficult option to manage logistically while construction is underway, and it will have additional costs because of the relocation of the students that other options do not have. There are other options that are less expensive and more responsive to our community's needs. Our community repeatedly supported maximizing open green space for playing fields and play structures that creatively balance security concerns in a busy commercial area. The option the committee chose has the least amount of green space and relegates all playing fields and play structures behind the school. Other options maximize green space use it more, and use it more creatively. These other options are less expensive and more responsive to our community's needs. Parents, teachers, and administrators repeatedly expressed a commitment to the K-8 model. It is the pedagogical foundation of all of our schools. The option selected is least conducive to that model because it divides the lower grades from upper grades in two separate distinct wings on opposite sides of the school. Other options allow the grades to be more integrated. There are other options that are less expensive and more responsive to our community needs. Is that over? Yes. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Maya. Sundar. And we have uh, Madhavir Prakash afterwards. Good morning. Good morning, Sunday. Uh, when, when I uh, came for you guys when you were uh, looking for recruits for the Override Study Committee, I, I told you I wanted to join because I think that uh, the challenges we're facing are the most important ones the town will go through for the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, it'll impact the schools, it'll impact housing and the quality of life for all citizens, whether they have students. People are indicating they can't hear you in the back. If okay. you can talk a little more into the, the classroom or not, I'll try my own little free arm extension here. <laughs> um, look, I think it's slow and challenging work because we need to solve many issues at once, none of them particularly easy, uh, and because we have to deal with people having less of what they want at the end of the process than they do at the beginning. Uh, that includes you know, less teachers per kids, less facilities per, 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 per student, and, and less money in people's wallets. I think we've made some clear progress. I think uh, Dr. Lupini's uh, program to start polling parents uh, is a great way to try and get a better uh, read of what the populace wants. Uh, it'd be great to find a way to be able to do that, I think, in advance of an override vote of, across a greater section of, of citizens so we can get a sense of what trade-offs uh, will, will, will work. Um, I also think that the plan to have, uh, to follow the OSC recommendation to have a, a professional look for additional nice school sites is a fantastic idea. But some key things uh, to my mind, remain off track. Uh, for all the discussion of a master plan, uh, I, I don't know that we've made enough tracks in that direction. Uh, I do not think we have sufficient backup plans if the plans right in front of us today don't work, especially given all of the concern by the school committee and others about the urgency of having a plan that does work. Uh, and I'm not yet sure that we have made the mind shift to solving the, the problems we have today. I mean, as an example, you know, when we did the Runkle renovation, I think the challenges the town was facing in terms of what to do with the schools are very different than the challenges we have today. That was a time where I think we were focusing on quality of physical plant and space. I'm not so sure, I mean, while there are issues there, I'm not so sure those, that that's the most urgent capital need we have today. I think the most urgent capital need that I hear today is total number of seats. 
Um, so, uh, you know, and in, in, in terms of master plan, and, and, and I also think that uh, it's clear to me we're going to need multiple overrides. And what I don't know is at what point the town's wallet gets fatigued. Uh, is the high school the most important dollars we're going to spend? Is elementary the most important dollars we're going to spend? I don't know. But whatever is on that third override, uh, I think, is, is, is uh, facing the longest odds. And maybe, may, you know, maybe the most least important, maybe the most important. Um, going back to the fact that uh, in terms of uh, return on our, on our investment, uh, and the need being not, not the quality of plant, but space. Uh, one of the things I just sent to you and, and, and sent you guys in a note was a Boston Globe article about there's a Ross school in Newton where they're going to build 24 new classrooms for $40 million, which includes a budget to buy land uh, from, from residents on a voluntary basis, but voluntary, they're going to make sure that that gets done. Uh, you know, just to put that in perspective, that's on the order of the total Driscoll budget and less than you know, half or maybe a third, depending on how, what number you use, for the Devo budget. So ima imagine if we took uh, $80 million as a thought experiment, we could have 1,050 brand new seats in what Newton calls the school of 2040 uh, and have money, le you know, left over for additional land purchases and have money left over for critical system upgrades, you know, across the schools that we've been talking about. I don't know if that's the right way to go, but it's certainly, in my mind, food for thought. Finally, the other thing I, I passed up to you was, was some math about the priority that I see for backup plans. The odds of the current plan going through, I don't think are particularly high. When I multiply having to have an override that passes, uh, that only has support of the minority of the override study committee, when I multiply that by the odds you put on actually securing MSBA funding for the current plan, and multiply it again, by realizing all the revenue enhancements proposed by the override study committee. If I put a 90%, 70%, and 80% across those three and multiply them, I, I'm still left with only 50%. Now, uh, you might put different weightings on it, but what that shows me is that we need plans. We need that more, you know, if we know we have 100% need, so I would suggest coming up with more backup plans so that if we have to shift gears, we're ready to do so, and we can still meet the urgency that you're hearing uh, from the school committee and others in terms of timing. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Prakash and Pam Roberts, you're next. Hi. Good morning. Thank you so much for listening to our my concerns. Speak right in. Can you hear me now? Speak closer. Speak right yeah, into the mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm actually speaking along with the first two speakers. I, I live in that same building. I've lived in Brookline for over 20 years. My children went to the elementary schools here and the high school, so I'm very invested in the, in the town. I'm also an academic physician. I teach residents at Harvard Medical School and I'm a business entrepreneur. So I, I'll keep it very short. I support what both my colleagues and friends said, Maya French and Min. We should have fiscal responsibility and we should do the best that we can as far as education for our children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pam Roberts, please. And Dominique Allmiller after that. Hi, I am a current parent at Devotion, started in the 90s. My eldest is in college. Um, I am also on the Devotion Building Committee, although I speak as a private citizen today. I, uh, I urge you to support um, group two. Uh, we <laughs> I'm a former, as a, as a former PTO president, um, I have seen the school get more and more crowded devotion and all the schools in fact, and um, this affects quality, this affects um, how our children learn. As a former chair of the uh, Old South Church in Copley Square, we have a saying that the church is one generation away from extinction. And to that end, we take care of the church school and the children, even though they're not the largest population in the church, but we make sure that we have another generation coming. And I like to think we 
apply the same methodology to a town. Our children don't have votes, um, but they are the next generation. And if families with children don't come, eventually the town will die out. A small town, a uh, big town, they will. I've, I've seen it happen. I grew up in Maine, and that's what happens when a school system isn't supported. I urge you to support the larger number. Thank you. Thank you. Dominique and Susanna Stern, you're next. Hi, I'm Dominique Gagnier Allmiller. Um, I teach at Brookline High School, and I'm actually here during my preparation period, so I have to leave right after I talk. No offense. Um, so um, this is my 14th year teaching at the high school. I teach French and Spanish, and sometimes Latin. Um, I also live in Coolidge Corner, and my two children go to devotion school. Um, I'm the vice president of the BEU, and for about eight years, I've been the co-chair of the sick leave bank. So um, I was here just like the woman ahead of me to speak on behalf of the students. Um, one statistic I found in the override report that was really interesting was that although kindergarten numbers have increased by 50% in the last 10 years, um, the per pupil spending, you know, adjusted for inflation has decreased um, since the last override. So thinking of the students, one way that this impacts students is um, in my classes, like a French film class that I teach, that's for juniors and seniors, we can have these intense discussions when we have 15 kids in the room. But last year when I had 28, there are at least 10 kids every day who weren't talking. So it starts to chip away at the kids if we don't, you know, if, if we can't take care of them in French, then they go on to science where they have science labs that um, are too crowded and they can't perform certain experiments. Um, you know, maybe they have 28 kids there too. And so this is really like hitting those voters to be, you know, like the woman before me spoke. You know, the kids can't vote yet, but they, you know, they count. And um, teachers get really worried. We get, we're really attached to our kids, and we really want them to have a good, have a good experience. Uh, my own children are being very well taken care of at Devotion. Um, there's probably 10 adults who help my son through the day who has an IEP. Um, even the guidance counselor, the, somebody who lets them read the um, Pledge of Allegiance every Wednesday. And um, so for me, it's very emotional, like both on behalf of my students and my own children. Um, so just so you you know, pay attention to these kids and put them first. Thank you. So, thank you. Susanna and Mike Toffel, you're next. Thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Susanna Stern. I live in Brookline. I work in downtown Boston and I have two daughters who came up through Runkle and are now at the high school. So my perspective is both as a resident of Brookline with a long-term perspective and also with a person who has a lot of immediate interest in the schools but also profound interest and commitment to education. I have been a steady volunteer at our schools and involved both at the school at Runkle and at the high school and in the town level on education matters. I'm here to urge you to be bold and practical and support what works in our great school system. That includes supporting our wonderful teachers with decent salaries and salary increases, and also supporting the METCO system. According to a 2011 comprehensive study of METCO by the Pioneer Institute, together with Harvard Law School, METCO is a highly successful program that provides long-term benefits to all students. Quoting from the program, it provides high quality education to students from challenged urban communities while creating opportunities for urban and su suburban students to benefit from racial and economic diversity. The study backs this up with research and numbers including test results and long-term success. Our experience here in Brookline reinforces this my children benefited from the economic and racial diversity provided by METCO, which is a well-run program with highly motivated kids. Support for METCO is not just good for kids in the program and my own kids and the kids in the school, but it is also the right thing to do. We are lucky to have such a great school system in a very well-run town, and we have a civic duty to share that benefit with our neighbors in challenged school districts. The overrides proposed require small sacrifices from each of us individually, but
but provide great benefits to our community. They would go even further to ensure good salaries and reasonable salary increases for our teachers, who are the pillars of our education system. Education is one of the number one issues in our country and one of, or should be, one of our greatest social values. So the cost benefit is clearly in favor of each of us paying a little more to ensure the continuity of our education system, including this small but successful effort through the METCO system toward equity in our education. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you're up, and Beth Stram, you're on deck. Hello, I'm Mike Toffel. I'm a parent of two devotion children, and I'm a parent rep on our school site council. Uh, I want to speak mostly about the debt exclusion, the capital override. Um, it seems to me that the group one's approach is a piecemeal wait and see approach. And this is the opposite of the strategic leadership that we need right now. This piecemeal wait and see approach is one reason our crisis has arisen and a piecemeal wait and see approach doesn't seem to me to be the way forward. We've seen a similar incremental approach unfold in Washington with these highly unproductive and divisive debates about the debt ceiling. It's a parallel situation to the one we find ourselves in now and it erodes public faith in our political leadership and it is not a strategic approach. Why on earth would we want to pursue that approach? What we need right now is the strategic foresight and strategic leadership, and that's what Group 2's approach to the debt exclusion more closely approaches. I also want to share my perspective as an involved member of the devotion parent community who's waited patiently for the long promised, long overdue renovation to turn our crumbling school into a school we can all be proud of. We've, as a community, have been I think quite patient and I think also quite gracious about accepting a portion of the burden of the increasing townwide school enrollment crisis uh, by adding, agreeing to add 150 to 200 students to our population. But I also want to say that there's also uh, a growing movement to remind everyone that that's the cap and not the floor of enrollment that the community is going to get behind. So should uh, others block uh, a more strategic approach, I would urge you to be clear in figuring out what is this backup plan? Where are those students going to go? Because in the devotion history, last time we renovated, we opened with more students than the renovation had been planned for. And there's a growing intolerance for that history to be repeated in devotion. Um, I also want to uh, speak briefly about the operating budget override and, rem and remind you that even today, with today's enrollment, there are unmet needs uh, in, the, in the budget and th these are only going to grow with the new population that's coming. And I want to say that if you vote to put on the ballot anything less than the budget that was proposed by Superintendent Lupini, I think Real leadership requires you to articulate where you think these savings ought to come. And the override study committee, each of the committees had their own opinions about this, but now that it's in your court, I think it's important for anyone who thinks that we don't need what Lupini has proposed to be very clear about what it is actually you think that we don't need. So finally, just to summarize, we need a long-term plan with long-term funding I think a clear articulation of backup plans is highly needed, as other speakers have said. And I think transparency about the rationale of your decision will help strengthen our faith in the political leadership of our town. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Um, Superintendent Lupini has actually told us that he thinks he needs something in excess of Either, the re either of the recommendations, Group 1 or Group 2. So I, I just want to be clear as to what you are supporting. Are you supporting the superintendent? Um, yes. I'm supporting the superintendent and suggest that these two subcommittees have their mm -hmm. own opinions about what might be cut. Yeah. Of course, ultimately, it's in the school committee's jurisdiction, as I understand. But given that you are going to approve 
an amount, it seems to me beholden on you, if your amount is less than what the superintendent requests, where you hypothesize those savings might arise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Stram and Emily England is after Beth. Good morning. My name is Beth Stram. I was a member of the Override Study Committee. I speak today as a private citizen and a homeowner in Powell Street. I've already spoken to you about uh, my support for the Group 2 recommendation for the, the operating override. I am here today to speak more specifically on my, my thoughts on the, the capital recommendation. The Group 1 recommendation suggests that flexibility exists within the, sec within the system to delay a second expansion. And based on my experience and the analyses that the override study committee did, I will say that that is a theory that is not proven. And it does not acknowledge the challenges of implementation on the ground. For example, in this year, the superintendent was able to reduce the number of classrooms in the upper grades by collapsing classrooms and, and having to go above class size policies, and yet the overall average in the system remains the same as the last year. So I think that what we need to be asking ourselves in this override is what if that theory is wrong? And indeed, we are possibly acting too late now. The kids are already here, the buildings are overcrowded, and the schools have already pulled the, almost all the rabbits that they have in their hat to solve the problem. They have already pushed assignments of schools later. They have already expanded buffer zones. Offices have been converted into substandard classrooms that cannot accommodate the average class sizes that are proposed in the Group 1 recommendation. Beeps have been moved out and students are being sent to Old Lincoln School. If the, if the theory that we can fit more students into our current schools now is wrong, then we, we will continue to have to rely on Old Lincoln School in the future and we will not have a backup plan to address the high school problem. Also, devotion cannot be the only solution to this problem. Many of the schools are severely overcrowded already. We have students that are eating lunch at 10.30 in the morning. In dr morning drop-offs, it is very difficult to pass through the halls. We need to relieve pressure in the schools and we need to do it in a more urgent timeline. We have delayed action long enough. I support that there be funding left available in the CIP to be able to support more than one school expansion and be able to do so in a more timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Emily England and David Root, you're next. Hello, my name is Emily England. Um, I'm a parent of three children at Baker School. I'm also the PTO president and a um, parent representative site council. I'm speaking as a parent. I have moved to the town with my family six years ago, and I have been attending meetings. I was here through the whole B-Space process through the summer. I followed the override study committee. I attend the leadership meetings monthly with Dr. Lupini. I attend school committee meetings, and I will be back here tonight for the Hancock Village meeting. Um, in my humble opinion, we've really talked this enrollment crisis to death over the past six years, and we still have a problem that with very little in terms of a viable and positive solution. So sadly, I'm ready to concede to the idea that my, my three children, which I have twins in second grade and a daughter in fifth grade, who are the two largest sections of Baker, um, five sections each, and my twins are together in a classroom of 24 in second grade. That's five sections. Um, I'm ready to concede that they're going to have bigger class sizes, that music will be in the auditorium, that the learning center is in a closet, um, that they may have to move to Old Lincoln at some point, they may have to undergo construction, um, be in a building that's undergoing construction. But I'm not ready to concede on the high school. So we still have time to address this high school issue. We know that in 2019, the high school will be over capacity. Dr. Lupini has made that very clear. 
And I think it would be shameful for us to not look at solutions now when we have five years to address it. I ask you to think about the override and their suggestions, but I also ask you to consider the high school now too in the CIP. It would be a real mistake to have five years to address a problem we know we are gonna have and look back five years from now and know we had done nothing about it. Brookline is better and smarter than just planning now to do split schedules, which Dr. Lupini has talked about, in five years. If that's our solution. So when you look at the override numbers, please consider the high school. You have the power to add to the override and consider the high school, and I ask you to do it now so we're not here five years later having the same discussion. Thank you. Thank you. David Root and Megan Zorn is next. Thank you. Uh, I am a uh, Brookline parent of uh, two Lawrence children, and uh, we live on uh, Newell Road. Um, I, I think that the Brookline schools are a treasure of Brookline, and all of us benefit uh, from these schools both directly through the education of our children and indirectly uh, through the, the value of our property, reflecting the fact that for uh, uh, generations, uh, uh, the, the great educational system in Brookline has been a big part of uh, what makes Brookline what it is. I'm concerned about uh, adequate funding for several um, aspects of the system. Uh, that are very stressed by the exploding school population. Uh, the infrastructure, of course, which already has uh, great needs and, uh, and, and needs expansion. Uh, the operational needs of maintaining our programs right now with this exploding uh, school population, maintaining those into the future. And also, and maybe uh, most urgently in a way, is maintaining the human capital, the great administrators and teachers that we have. Uh, it takes a while to erode that, uh, but once it starts, it also takes a long time to stop that process as well. Um, I, I have concerns that we uh, approach both the short and long term aspects of this problem now given where we stand at this point, where there are urgent needs and long-term needs. And uh, there we have uh, very capable and very dedicated selectmen and school board and parents who are working hard on this. But I'm particularly concerned that we adequately, adequately resource the thinking about this problem. Uh, we need um, uh, enough people, whether it be uh, bringing in quickly enough the consulting about the physical infrastructure, the siting of, uh, of new structures, building, and so forth, bringing in the help that the selectmen, the school board, and the parents need to be able to uh, create options and solutions for this problem. I know many have been created, but uh, the need to push both the short, medium, and long-term plans uh, to fruition is urgent now, and uh, we need to invest that in that. My, my uh, wife and I would be supportive of uh, the larger override and of a larger override with the rationale for spending that money uh, for the infrastructure, the operations, and for maintaining our, our uh, great human capital and for the planning that is so sorely needed to be pursued very aggressively right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Megan Zorn and Manny Howard, please. Uh Take the on-deck circle. My name is Megan Zorn. I'm a Driscoll parent. Um, and I'm actually here to support the recommendations of majority OSC members, as I strongly object to a debt exclusion any larger than that needed to fund devotion and feel overall caution is appropriate. Am I not speaking into my, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. The current capital project recommendations come at a stunning cost of approximately $165 million to renovate and expand two schools. Newton North cost $197 million, is the most expensive public school ever built in Massachusetts and ranks fourth in terms of cost nationwide. But $197 million seems paltry in comparison to the cost we're considering for the minimum gain we'll get. With Hancock Village a go and school growth exceeding projections, the expansions of devotion in Driscoll will not solve the problem of overcrowding in our elementary schools, and we've yet to touch on the high school. 
Given our current direction, $165 million is only the beginning of a spending spiral until we understand what brought us to a $110 million price tag for devotion and a long-term facilities plan is completed by qualified professionals who carefully and neutrally assess all realistic options, I would argue not one more dime. I'm glad the town has finally agreed to look for a ninth school site, but I'm also wary. In the past, we've heard from both SC and board members that there's no appropriate site. Unless the search for a site involves qualified neutral professionals given minimal parameters, I fear the answer to whether we can identify a site is a foregone conclusion. I add the OSC estimated a ninth school absent the cost of land acquisition would be around 47 million. The proposal to expand Driscoll is hovering around 55. But regardless of what project you support, if we allow a debt exclusion to include an undefined capital improvement project, we have lost our voice. We will have no say in how that money is spent. I have heard from students, parents, and teachers heartfelt support for METCO and materials fees. If we want to keep these programs, we must acknowledge the need for substantially more space. I urge community members fighting for those programs to expand your fight to include ensuring the possibility of a ninth school receives fair consideration, and that includes fighting against funds for an as yet undefined project. If a ninth school fails, these programs will likely be back in jeopardy as expand in place appears too costly to continue. Finally, I would urge you not to believe the hype. Decisions of this importance should not be made out of fear born from threats and misinformation. When a frustrated Driscoll parent asserted he would fight the override, an SC member responded, then we'll send your kids to OLS with no renovations. And when an advisory committee member asked what would happen if Driscoll were not expanded, an SC member responded we would have 35 kids to a class. These statements amount to fear mongering used to quell dissent and there is no truth to any of them. The majority members of the OSC articulated reasonable solutions to manage school growth while we look for better solutions. Similarly, many parents responded with understandable concern to Dr. Lupini's suggestion that the high school might have to run from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. to accommodate its population. This suggestion is outrageous, and we would never let that happen, at least not as long as we have a say. Allotting funds for an unarticulated project or the ineffective proposed plans gives away the community's essential oversight and I ask you to ensure that doesn't happen by holding tight to the purse strings. There should be no money until recommendations are obtained from qualified professionals with no dog in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. And Charla, Whit Charla Whit Whitley, next. Thank you, good morning. My name is Manny Howard. I live at uh, Bradford Terrace, which is a, a very near neighbor of the Devotion School. Uh, we have uh, 26 unit owners in Bradford Terrace. Um, there are approximately eight, seven or eight unit owners with kids in the devotion school and little kids coming up to uh, in that area, uh, five or six years, uh, five years old and um, four years old and so forth for the next several years. But when I'm uh, thinking of uh, the devotion school, uh, I think back at the uh, size of, of uh, schools for a K through eight, uh, kids uh, five, six, seven years old, in a school that's uh, right now over, as I understand, over 800 students, uh, expanding to about 1,000. Uh, that seems to me, um, as a uh, father of uh, several children, uh, who've uh, gone up through the public schools uh, and a, a grandfather of others in uh, uh, public schools uh, seems to be uh, a very large student population for a K through eight age group. Uh, going to uh, the option that's been discussed, option one, uh, option one would tend to lower the value of our 26 units who are the very near neighbors. It's going to bring a building, a new building, within 25 feet of our property, which will cast a shadow on our property, which will prevent light of the sun reaching a lot of our property, which will prevent the warmth of the sun reaching our property, which will cut out and create, uh, strike that, which will create a, uh, for a path of light pollution at night because as I understand it, it will encompass 
a uh, walkway that's uh, lighted within very close perimeter of our uh, buildings. And uh, also, it is the, there are other reasons for rejecting an, uh, option one. It will be, uh, it has the least amount of open space of the three options. It has the least energy efficient plan of the three options. And it's the most expensive of the three options. And I urge you to consider the other two options very much. And in, in, in essence, we, my wife and I, grew up in public schools. We support public schools. But we want the public schools to be planned. And I emphasize planned wisely, not only for the present, but for the future and make the numbers and make the projections as real as possible. We don't want, we've heard of mission creep in a, in a different perspective in, uh, in Washington. We don't want budget creep in our town. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Charla and Andrew Shalit after, after Charla. Hi, so my name is Sharla. I have a fifth and a seventh grader at Devotion. I'm also um, a co-chair of the PTO, but I speak today as, my, as a parent. So thanks for giving us this opportunity. And I want to speak on two things. I want you to put on the ballot a larger debt exclusion, and I want to, uh, the larger override. Uh, for the debt exclusion, I see Runkel, and I've been to the schools that are renovated in this town, and they are beautiful, and the community really takes pride in them and I would like for all the people that use devotion to be able to take pride in it as well. I was at the school yesterday afternoon and for the first time I was dropping in and the school was actually closed. <laughs> I think that goes to show how much it is used after school on the way home from soccer practice. My son needs to pick up his homework. The school doors are open. We run in and get his things. Um, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning and the kids need a drink of water, the school is open because there's a church there. And, um, and so, so many people will appreciate that building and the use that it'll, it'll allow for so many people. So the second thing is um, the override. So I, very, I worry about the larger class sizes. We moved here from Chicago where my daughter was in a class of 30. And she, like um, Dominique was saying, she never spoke. She was um, actually labeled an underperforming child. We were going through the process of getting an IEP for her. And we moved here, and she has become a great student with a, a, a great record now and very participating in class. And I worry that as the classes get bigger, that some of those children that are on the edge will actually have to demand more services and then we'll not be getting the cost savings that we want to out of this choice. So thanks for letting me speak again and um, you know that I will be supporting a larger debt uh, exclusion and a larger override vote. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Shalit and then uh, I hope I'm saying your name right, Sarah Lynn Allaire after that. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Shallot. I live out in Greek Paris. I have a son in third grade at Pierce School and a three-year-old at the Lynch Center in Beep. I'm here to speak in favor of the larger debt exclusion and uh, Dr. Sperber's request for a larger override budget, um, operating budget. I've been watching this process the last few years. Um, first with B-Space and then with the Override Study Committee and each time through, I've been very optimistic because of the obvious intelligence and commitment of the committee members. And unfortunately, um, at the end of the process, it feels like we're left with the can getting kicked down the road. It's especially disappointing that we ended with a, a split on the Override Study Committee. And uh, that leaves it to, to you guys to finally um, make something stick here, and we really need that. Uh, during this time, the town has been patient 
parents and kids and teachers and the schools have been patient, but we're going to reach a breaking point at some point when there is no more room for the kids, when we do need to go to, to split schedules. Brookline schools are a treasure. Uh, it's something that we all need to um, be cognizant of. We, you know, we, we take it for granted that we have that in this town, but we may not have it forever. The challenges that are put on adults when they graduate from high school and then graduate from college are growing every year. This is not the time to cut down on the quality of education that we give to our children. Um, in terms of the, the divided report in the OSC, I just have to scratch my head when I, I look at the group, the, the recommendations from the group that recommended a smaller amount. Um, speaking of uncertainty about what the town will do and what the town's needs will be and recommending a smaller amount because of that uncertainty. If there's any uncertainty, it's on the, it's on the bigger side. You know, the plan, uh, the override study committee was premised on 630 kindergarten kids. Last year there were 650, this year there are 680. To the extent there's uncertainty, it's that we'll need more, not less, especially with Hancock Village coming online. Um, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars every year uh, renting space for BEEP. We clearly need more physical space um, in our schools. Um, I think ultimately we will probably need, in addition to expand in place, the ninth school. Um, it seems prudent to have money in the capital budget to build and to, to take the timely steps that will need it to be taken. Um, so I think I will, I will end there. Thank you and, and good luck to you. Thank you, An Andrew. Um, Sarah Lynn, and then Haiying Peng after that. Uh, Sarah Lynn Allaire, I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 16. Uh, like most people in Brookline, I highly value the having a high quality school system. And like most taxpayers, we don't want to pay more taxes that are absolutely necessary. When I attended the last uh, override study, or override uh, meeting, public meeting, uh, I came away with a lack of confidence about the need for the override, about if there is an override, what it would be used for and how much is needed. And finally, that sensible measures have been taken to reduce a need for an override. Uh, we learned at the last meeting that the school population had actually decreased this year, excluding kindergarten, in which a lot of non-resident students had, had, kindergarten students had been accepted, but the school population had actually decreased this year, admittedly, but not much. Uh, can historically, I, can, I just, can I just correct you on that? Because uh -huh. that, I do not believe, is true. There was a couple of grades that went down, but overall, the, the school population increased once again. Okay. okay. Historically, uh, the population has increased and decreased over time. Two graduate students uh, from MIT, according to the override study report, tried to model whether the increase we're experiencing now is permanent. They were unable to develop a model. Um, there are factors or reasons to believe that, that an increase now is permanent and factors to indicate that it's not, would not be permanent. Um, uh, these individuals felt that if there was a permanent increase, there would be a low to moderate increase. Uh, another person, speaker, um, at the last meeting was a financial expert who's on the advisory committee. And that person was very concerned about the, the budgeting uh, background of this, that there was really not a clear uh, information about uh, how much of an override is needed uh, uh, or what exactly it would be spent for. And of course, we see that the override study committee was evenly split on how much is needed and what it's needed for. Now there's talk again about whether a ninth school is needed. Dr. Lapini comes out and says that a great deal more is needed. He, of course, does not pay taxes here and presumably doesn't really care about the town overall. Uh, I'm concerned that there's a lack of sensible options that have been uh, taken. And um, 
These have been outlined, many of them in the study, uh, uh, override study report. First of all, I'd like to address non-resident students. There are 480 of these. They're in the METCO program and in the materials fee programs. Um, I think everybody agrees these are valuable programs and we'd like to keep them to some degree. But uh, as was pointed out by two different speakers, um, um, they're really based on a space needed basis and there doesn't appear to be the space now for them. I'd like to also bring up again the people who live on the borders of Brookline. Uh, this was considered last year but was dropped because of a lot of bad publicity. I don't think there's really any basis for continuing to include in the future students who are, live in Newton unless there are equal number of students in Brookline who attend schools in, in uh, Newton. I don't think there's really any reason to include students, us educating students from Newton. In terms of students from Boston, uh, I would think maybe some sort of financial situation could work out so that they pay a tuition or perhaps Boston would be give us some of their uh, finances. I'd like to bring up the, uh, the issue of the number of students in classrooms, including, uh, um, according to the study report, that its average is now 21. It's an increase from a student and a half from 10 year, over the last 10 years. Um, this, the study report seems to uh, suggest that an increase of one or two students uh, per classroom be based be considered, uh, I don't see that this is being considered. Uh, the maximum is now 24 to 25, uh, so it still would remain below that, the average. Now, of course, this is not, these are not spread out. So that one parent just told us there are 24 students in her child's classroom, but there are 83 classrooms with 20 or less students. And I suspect that these are in the Runkle and Heath schools because neither school has experienced an increase in students. Um, it would seem sensible, I mean, the Runkle borders the Driscoll school, and it would seem reasonable or sensible to have some of the uh, Driscoll schools be reassigned to the Runkle school. It's harder to utilize the Heath school, but I would suggest that a reasonable sensible solution for an increase in uh, Hancock Village students would be to bus them up to the Heath School when and if that occurs. You're at five minutes. Okay, um, just about done. Um, from the parents I get a sense unless the most money possible is being spent that the quality of their children's er education is going to deteriorate to that of the worst inner city schools and perhaps well, that's why at the public meeting option one was chosen for Runkle School. Uh, even though option 3A seems to be best in every way and including would be least disruptive to the students. Um, so uh, uh, for those reasons, I just came away and I have a lack of confidence of the need for the override, about whether the overrides have been well thought out in terms of how much and what is needed, and finally, whether uh, lack of confidence that sensible measures have been taken to reduce the need for override. Thank Thanks. you. Hi, Ling Ping and uh, Linda olson Pelkey after that. Hey, <coughs> my name is Hai Ping. I live in the Bradford. Speak into the mic. Uh, I live in the Bradford Terrace. Um, I have a daughter graduate from Devotion School, you now in the high school. Um, so in general, uh, I very much support the previous the, uh, the speaker. Uh, uh, I think that her uh, has point, a lot of point I want to point out. Um, in general, I do support large uh, tax write, but I'm very concerned how do you use these monies? Uh, the, how do you, did you carefully research all the options? What's the best way to spend these monies? Uh, I'm from a uh, corporate you know, background, so I know every corporation, when they are talk about big budget, there has to be you know, reviews, studies, and all the different options, and uh, what's the best way? A lot of times, you don't have to do a lot of studies. It's common sense. I think it, it just look at the common sense. Uh, I'm just looking at option one uh, for the devotion school. It's not the best options. Uh, it's uh, definitely the worst option, consider all the three options. Uh, cost more money, doesn't solve all the problems, and uh, create the problems. So that's all my, uh, that's all I want to say. So. 
Thank you. Linda Olson Pelkey, and then uh, Jessica Shuba. Good morning. My name is Linda Olson Pelkey. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 2. I want to thank you for holding a morning hearing. Thank you very much for us morning folks. Um, and I also want to thank the Override Study Committee for all of their work. I mean, I participated in a lot of the meetings, and it was just a phenomenal effort, and I really appreciate all their service to the town. In general, um, I'm here representing a, a homeowner without children in the schools, and I think that that's an important voice, and I think that one that doesn't get heard as much. And so I ask you all to forgive my cluelessness about the conditions in the schools and our educational um, programming, um, but I would hope that we can take that my cluelessness as a call to action for better education, outreach, and communication to all of the town. Because we ultimately are going to be asked to vote on this. In general, um, after reading the Override Study Committee report, I am uh, sympathetic to the majority recommendation. And the reason for that is because it takes a cautious and balanced approach, and um, it outlines some needed um, analysis going forward in terms of metrics and benchmarking. I think those are very important for us to do. And I think it feels to me like the beginning of a much needed process of dialogue and transparency, which in my entire tenure in the town and my six years as a town meeting member, um, when it comes to school budgeting questions, I think our, you know, that transparency has been lacking. Um, I'm going to say something about the METCO program. Um, I just feel that there was a little bit of a lack of uh, quantitative analysis when it comes to the program. I, along with it, most other people, definitely feel it's valuable for our students to have um, exposure to diversity. But I ask, what are the goals of the METCO program? What were the conditions when it was established? And how have those conditions changed? And have we met the goals of the program? And I would also look at the amount of diversity that is in our population. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of diversity are we talking about? And why are they valuable? For instance, I think we have great diversity in terms of ethnicities, countries of origin, language spoken, um, economic, socioeconomic status. And I think all of those are perhaps the most important. I think um, I did work a lot with the ooh, demographic subcommittee, and um, they made some recommendations. Um, uh, following all of our work, it's very hard to make predictions, as you know. But some of the most important things that came out of the work, I think, were the recommendations for tracking and data collection. And going forward, this is going to help us in our planning immensely, and we absolutely need to be serious about doing that. And how do we do that? Well, it requires funding for the town planning department or some other entity like that. And so I think that this brings up the balance that's needed in terms of all of the needs of the town. Um, I think we need long-term planning um, that's comprehensive and for instance, um, I think we need to think about the value of open space as our population increases and densifies. And uh, as an aside, I think um, on the devotion school proposal that the um, option chosen is perhaps too sprawled, too suburban in its um, massing, and it does limit the amount of open space. And I would also ask that people reconsider the um, mandate that all the play space has to be in the back. I don't agree with that. I like seeing the kids when I'm in Coolidge Corner. They feel like a part of our community. Um, 
Okay, well, can I just say one more thing? More. Okay, so um, as a general resident of the town, I am concerned with the fact that um, although we asked for a plan B if the override didn't pass from our school committee and our super the school superintendent, we never heard back. And I think that um, there's a general feeling that there is a need to set priorities and make some hard decisions because we're all being asked to sacrifice here and it should be across the board. Thank, Thank you. Linda. Jessica Shubo. And then uh, Dick Bank is next. Good morning. Um, before I address the override, which I will do briefly, I just want to extend an invitation to each of you and actually to everybody here in the hearing to join us on Saturday morning at Big uh, TV Studios to take a look at the uh, standardized test that's on the horizon for Brookline, the park test. Um, standardized testing swallows up a tremendous amount of space and time and resources, and it's in the background as we talk about what I'll address now. Um, the Brookline Educators Union stands with Dr. Lapini on the immediate uh, questions at hand. And I'm speaking this morning on behalf of educators who directly serve the students of Brookline every day as teachers, caseload spe specialists, and uh, paraprofessionals. Uh, they're dedicated to their students and they're currently delivering excellent uh, services under conditions that over time uh, will jeopardize the quality of the education uh, for which the schools, of course, are known. Uh, we affirm the importance of the recommendations of the override committee concerning the technology and specialized programs, but I appreciate the opportunity to draw attention to the fact uh, that the backbone of education in Brookline is the educators themselves and the conditions under which they teach. Uh, of course, it can't be denied that those teaching conditions are the students' learning conditions. And as you determine the financial commitment to our schools uh, that the citizens uh, might vote to make, we ask that you consider conditions under which our students are learning that could continue uh, with inadequate funding. And it uh, hopefully will be clear with, through just a few examples, just a couple of illustrations that averages don't tell the story of what is happening with current staffing ratios, uh, which could just be replicated on a larger scale if we're not deliberate about this. The rates of hiring that fall below enrollment growth or that merely catch up with it won't adequately correct situations such as the following. Today, uh, from 60 to 90 students can be in a room with only a single educator who is knowledgeable about uh, carrying out the building safety protocols. Another example, uh, to maximize available staff uh, teaching time, classes often start at the same minute that the previous class ends. So for example, an art teacher for um, a set up and break down his or her materials intensive classroom during students' learning time can't have a meaningful one-to-one -one conversation with the students at the beginning or the end of the class. Let me give you an illustration from the middle school. Uh, individual attention to student work has necessarily decreased as class sizes have increased. So with student load increasing as it has, even while spending an additional 18 hours of her workday over the course of a week, if a teacher assesses just one piece, one piece of writing, a project, a quiz, or a test of each of her students, she can devote only two minutes to each piece of that student work. Thanks. As the number of Brookline education, uh, special education students grows and staffing lags behind, teachers are increasingly leaving the class to attend the meetings that address individual students' educational needs. Um, paraprofessionals, accordingly, uh, must teach an increasing number of those classes while the teachers are gone. So these are just illustrations, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, bring to you a request from the Brookline Educators Union that we set up a meeting so we can talk a little bit more about some of the on-the-ground situations right now um, and give you a fuller picture. I look forward to following up on that, not being able to really do justice to, to the uh, level of detail. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Dick, you're next, and Joseph Siegel after that. Thank you. Um, I actually had some slides, but I'm going to spare you those slides in the uh, interest of time. But uh, uh, there is a handout, and I ask that you follow along. I'm Dick Benka. Um, 
co-chair of the override study committee, and I'm addressing some of the arguments that the study committee's recommendation should be adjusted. My theme here today really is that we have to tell voters both sides of the story and that you have to be honest with the voters when you're going to them uh, for a multi-million dollar override. First, the argument was made that there is a larger kindergarten class than anticipated this year. On the other hand, um, classes do vary from year to year. There were three classrooms saved through consolidations in the upper grades. 44 non-resident kindergarten students were admitted before resident enrollments were known. The available space and available seats policies were not followed. Non-resident sibling assignments were made and were given preferences before resident assignments were known. At the $11,000 per student short run cost and $15,000 per student long run incremental costs, uh, it's about a $5.5 million to $7.5 million per year cost, long run costs or short run costs for non-resident students in the system. And of these, it's about a four and a half to five and a half or six and a half million dollar annual subsidy to Boston for Boston students who are in the system. Second, the argument that uh, we should uh, use a 2% figure for collective bargaining rather than a 1% figure. Uh, the public schools provided a 1% number throughout the OSC process to the OSC. And if you uh, turn to the second page of your packet, there's a chart. A 2% collective bargaining uh, increase actually yields under the step structure in place in the uh, Brookline schools, a five to 7% increase to teachers who are on steps. And that occurs for 12 to 15 years, depending on the lane that they're in. Um, if you turn to the next slide, this slide, uh, the school peer comparison does not cherry pick districts, but it looks at all of the school peer districts that have been looked at in the last two overrides. And um, if you look, you can see that 2% has not been the standard uh, increase across uh, uh, our school peer communities. Uh, some have been at 0% with an increase at the last step only. Uh, some have been at 2% or a little higher. A number have been at 1%, 1.35%. 1 to 2 percent and so forth. So there is a broad range. Uh, 2 percent is certainly not a standard increase. Moreover, and very importantly, Brookline is extremely high, thank you, Brookline is extremely high relative to most other communities with respect to its contribution for employee, employee health insurance. Um, our school peers have used a variety of other tools, lower overall employer percentage contribution, uh, lower for uh, PPO and POS rather than HMOs, uh, lower for part-time employees not offering indemnity plans, lower for new employees relative to grandfathered over, older employees and so forth. The fact is that a 1% reduction in the employer contribution to health insurance could free up $250,000 a year for uh, COLAs or other uses. Third, um, there was an argument that we need a larger override to avoid risk. And here, on the other hand, the entire override study committee model is based and premised on conservative revenue projections that already cushion for risk. I was on the board when these projections were made, uh, um, and I'm, uh, when we were in the, uh, um, when, when we have used the uh, process of making conservative long run projections. And that's entirely appropriate for budgeting purposes. Uh, we're looking out long term, we're looking out long range. Uh, having uh, conservative projections satisfies the DOR when we go to them and ask for, a, for our. Uh, tax rate to be approved, conservative projections, uh, free up, uh, free cash for capital needs. But again, when we're asking the voters for millions or tens of millions of dollars, you have to be honest with them. And I'd ask you just to take a look at the last page, which is a chart. Our recent one, two, and three-year revenue projections going out 
have been six to nine million dollars below our actual revenues. And they've been three to five million dollars below our actual revenues, not counting increases in state aid that occurred in fiscal year 13 and fiscal year 14. So to we have to look we have to look at both sides of the picture. We have to give both sides of the picture to the voters. Um, I would just ask you to think about one item, which is a possible commitment to the voters that if there is an override, you commit that you would implement the non-revenue tax increases and that if revenues, as has been the recent case, are substantially above or are above the projections, that the tax rate be reduced in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Joseph Siegel, and we'll take uh, Rebecca Mant Mantner after that. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joseph Siegel, and I've lived in Brooklyn and owned our, owned our home on Beacon Street for the past 11 years. Will you, speak, will you speak closer to the mic, please? Sure. sure. Um, by occupation, I'm an electrical engineer, and I've been designing computers, microprocessors, and integrated circuits for the past 35 years. My career has been spent largely in Massachusetts and in Silicon Valley, California, and I'm currently a design fellow for, at Advanced Micro Devices. My understanding is that you want to hear from the public regarding the proposed override being considered this coming May. Today I am here to express my support for the METCO program and ask the board for their continued support. I would like the board to continue funding the 30 students per year who move through the Brookline Public Schools. In the high-tech electronics business, a diverse workforce is one of the most valuable and important assets a company has. In today's global economy, most high technology firms are international and have a very diverse workforce consisting of Hispanics, Asians, Eastern Europeans, and Africans. Caucasian Americans are quickly becoming a minority in the high-tech workforce, and these are facts. In my experience, those people who adapt and are sensitive to the mores of cultures and the mores and cultures of other other than their own excel in their job. Those people who have difficulty doing so are often left behind. I have to believe that my experience is true for all high tech fields today, not just computers and electronics. For Brookline students to succeed in getting a job in high technology, it is likely they will be interviewed by a very diverse team of people. Having our students experience relating to people of diverse backgrounds will benefit them many times in their careers. Growing up with people of different economic and cultural backgrounds may one day prevent someone from inadvertently insulting someone during a business interaction. This can be embarrassing and career limiting. <laughs> the people of Brookline owe it to their children to educate them not only in the arts and sciences, but also educate them to have the interpersonal skills they will need to converse with a diverse group of people. METCO provides the students of Brookline Public Schools the opportunity to get an early start working with people whose backgrounds differ from their own. Yes, sir. Don't continue to support METCO just to be charitable. Support METCO because it will give our children an advantage in a global economy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rebecca and uh, Chad, you're next. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I've spoken with each of you on various occasions as a Driscoll parent, as a METCO supporter, as a town meeting member. Today I'd like to speak to you as someone who's worked in the field of municipal finance and assisted cities and towns to raise capital through the bond markets. We need an approach to the town school enrollment uh, crisis that is most likely to solve the problems that is before us, partly because it's the right thing to do for voters and for the capital markets, and we need to do it in the least expensive way. Just want to speak to the first point more as a voter and someone who's active in the town and active in the leadership of Driscoll School. We know with certainty that we need expanded elementary school capacity beyond what the devotion school can provide. We know with certainty that we will need an expanded high school. We know we may need to acquire new land for a ninth elementary school. With these facts, and so with these facts, we need an approach that actually addresses the problem we have before us. As a town meeting member, someone active in my school, I can't ask my neighbors to vote for an override that does not actually try to address what we have before us. I think it's irresponsible. We can't 
given that we know we have these problems before us and we know we may need to acquire land in the new, near future for a ninth school, I think it would be absolutely irresponsible to use all of the town's existing debt capacity to fund the devotion renovation. If we fund Devo full, if we use a bond issue for the entire devotion, the entire amount of the town's share of a devotion cost, presumably in around the $75 million area, we, actually, we have an opportunity, we have two opportunities before us we don't have with a smaller capital override. One, we have existing debt capacity to respond flexibly to situations that may present themselves. And I currently work in the field of real estate development. And when acquiring land, having capital available that you can access quickly is absolutely essential to getting the, to having the most economic, uh, as a buyer, to getting the absolute best deal. So we need that flexibility. And now that we're talking about ninth school, we need it more than we ever have before. And if some property becomes available and we have to wait for six or nine months to go to the voter, to town meeting and the voters, we may be costing the town tens of millions of dollars. That would be completely irresponsible. We also know that today's interest rates are at historic lows, rates that would have been considered almost unachievable for almost the entire 20th century. It's possible that this good, economic, this good interest rate fortune will continue over the next number of years, but I think it would be, uh, doesn't seem very realistic to think that it will. What we do know is they're going to need expanded school capacity. We do know we will need to borrow more money. If we fund the devotion cost entirely with a bond issue, or our share of it, about $75 million, we have an opportunity to access the capital necessary to address our town's needs in the lowest cost way. Uh, for example, if we were to optimistically say our additional capital needs beyond the devotion renovation are $100 million for elementary and high school expansion, a 1% reduction in interest rates is $100,000 annually. Over 30 years, it's $3 million. We can talk about present value, I won't go into that right now, but with interest rates going up, we are talking about millions of dollars. Funding as much as we can of our schools of our town's capital needs for schools now it to raise interest rates is one of the most fiscally responsible things we can do, and I urge you to do it, and I look forward to having this conversation with my fellow neighbors and voters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chad? Hi, I'm uh, Chad Ellis. I was a member of the Override Study Committee. I'm a town meeting member, and I'm a runkle parent with two daughters. Um, I want to talk to you not about uh, any specific recommendations, um, but about the importance of embracing and having difficult conversations. Uh, to me, an override is not just, a, not just a necessary step in the town's meeting its financial needs, but it's an opportunity for us to really talk about what is important in Brookline, where our values are, and how best to meet those values. And with that in mind, I want to push back a little bit. I have a great deal of personal and professional respect for Dr. Lapini. I want to push back a little bit on a comment that he made during his presentation about how the Override Study Committee incorrectly referred to things as levers, where we have choices to make, uh, that he said should be thought of as values. And I want to push back on that because it's important not to lose sight of the need to consider things even when we hold them as values. Uh, limited resources means that we can't achieve all the things we would like to do. And values can come into conflict, as in the case of wanting to have small class sizes simultaneously with bringing in non-resident students. It's also important not to conflate values with the programs that we currently use to meet those values. If we consider the value of diversity, for example, if I look at the Brookline school system and say, what is the biggest impact I would like to see in diversity? It would be an increase in staffing. When I think of my own experience, having minority students in my classrooms as a student was very important to me. But nothing had a bigger impact than having a sixth grade teacher who was African American, my only one as, as a uh, elementary student. Uh, we now are spending somewhere between four and five million dollars on the METCO program every year. And it's important to be honest about that number. It's also important to ask, is that the best way that we can meet Brookline's values towards diversity? Think what you could do with a fraction of that amount of money aimed at programs supporting the hiring of minority staff and teachers. Similarly, we all agree that attracting and retaining excellent teachers is incredibly important. 
materials fee program is a tool towards doing that. It's a tool that benefits a minority of, of teachers, and it is not necessarily the only tool that we have. So I just want to emphasize we are coming into conflict with the things that we'd like to do. At the, uh, one of the last override study committee meetings, uh, the chair of the school committee expressed the clear view that if the group one recommendation were to be passed, that it was absolutely certain that the uh, enrichment and challenge support program would be dropped, not just not increased as the Dr. Lupini's budget called for, but actually would be eliminated. Uh, when I pointed out that that would be, you could raise the money not only to maintain it, but to increase it as Dr. Lupini recommended with as little as a 10% reduction in, in, uh, in the METCO program, I was told, well, the community is not there. That's never going to happen. And maybe it shouldn't. Maybe that would be too high a cost to maintain the Enrichment and Challenge Support Program. But that's the conversation that we need to have. We can only have it if we're upfront about what these programs cost. We can only have it if we're upfront about the trade-offs. And we can only have it if we have an honest conversation about what our alternatives are, rather than simply saying, this program should never be cut. This program should never be touched. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did I not announce the next one? I'm sorry, Joanna Baker, you're next. And after Joanna, Carol Levin. Good morning. Good morning, Joanna. Um, please don't think that I'm reading um, email on my phone. I took notes to myself to speak to you on the phone, so. Good, our friend Tommy Vitolo told me once it looks bad when you're looking at your phone, but this is where my notes are. So good morning. I'm Joanna Baker. I'm a resident of Brookline. I'm an activist in the town. I have no kids. So the schools are just something I value because public education is an American value. Um, I'm an activist because my parents ra raised me to be an activist. And um, I'm here this morning because I'm grateful that you're holding public hearings to listen to the public. And I admire your dedication to public service. Many of us here are activists, but you're the super activists because you go to meetings for hours and hours and hours. And thank you for holding these hearings and for listening to us. I believe all of us are stewards of the legacy of what makes Brookline great, but you're the super stewards. <laughs> and um, you know, I want to acknowledge so many people who attend so many meetings who are here this morning and have been here but had to go to work or school. Um, I, I want to address in particular Linda olson Palke, um, who, like me, is an activist in town, like me, has no kids in the schools. Um, and like her, I yearn for better two-way communication and outreach and more dialogue and transparency, in particular with the school committee and the Brookline Public Schools, over which I realize you have no control. But I do take this opportunity publicly to say more transparently, more dialogue, more two-way communication. We're going in that direction. Please, more and more. It's good to see, good to hear. Um, in an effort to address Linda's question about METCO, um, it so happens that a program here in Brookline called Race Reels, which is a once a week film program at Brookline Interactive Group, will be hosting on Wednesday, October 29th at 545 a filmmaker, a woman named Candace Sumner. Her film is called Far From Home. It spotlights Candace, an insightful, precocious African American teenager participating in METCO a voluntary Boston school integration program. Since kindergarten, she has risen before dawn each day to be bused to Weston, an affluent, predominantly white suburb. Now in her last two years of high school, she takes us inside her personal triumphs and daily negotiations, serving as the first black class president, playing the college admissions game, defying stereotypes she feels from white society, and living up to her family's tradition of activism. Candace's grandfather, a civil rights activist, was murdered in 1968. He helped found the busing program, METCO, and her mother was among the first black students bused to the suburbs in the late 1960s. Through cinema verite and interviews, the film weaves together Candace's current school life with a family history that has been profoundly shaped by racially integrated educational experiences. This is at 545. Um, I'm sorry, it's not at Brookline Interactive Group. It's at the MLK room at Brookline High. Um, pizza at 545, free, film at six. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the reason I bring this up is that we may have forgotten the value that METCO brings to the greater Boston area. And I think this film is one example of a way to remind ourselves what's valuable about METCO. 
Um, it was established to, rest, to address the history of racial segregation and unequal access to high quality education in Boston and greater Boston. And our work is not done. And I think it's very important value to Brookline and we need to put dollars behind it to make sure as you craft an override that you make sure there's enough room for all the students we educate in Brookline, including our important METCO students in all of the grades. Thank you for your continued support and activism in town. Thank you, Joanna. Carol Levin and then Stanley Spiegel. Yep, it's true. Hi. Um, first of all, as we speak today about financial responsibility, I have to commend the town on not overheating this room. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make a comment. If it was summertime, you would be hot too, just so that you understand. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm here this morning as a member of the Override Study Committee, a member of the Capital Committee of the Override Study Committee, a member of the Group 1 majority on the Override Study Committee, and also um, a former parent, a, a parent of former Brookline uh, students who um, I was very active in the PTO, both at Runkle and at the high school. I was at the executive board of the high school PTO. Um, but I would like to focus my comments today on the debt exclusion portion of the override and a concern I have about, um, uh, it's clear to me in hearing comments today that there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions about, about both how the debt exclusion operates and what it means to the schools. And I'm going to urge you as the selectmen as this process plays out over the ensuing months to uh, provide some greater opportunities or educational um, information to the electorate to make sure that they understand exactly what it is that they will be voting for and to help tamp down the misconceptions and the passions that we've gotten a little hint of today. Uh, first of all, I want to make it clear that by voting for the lower debt exclusion, that does not mean there will be no capital left to uh, address some of the needs that the town, that the schools will have for capital improvements going forward. Um, the CIP of the town does, over the long term, make sure that um, various improvement projects for the schools are budgeted for. I'd like to remind everyone that the Runkel project did not require a debt override. The lower number in uh, being recommended by the majority for the debt exclusion, in addition to funding the devotion project, also has funds to be invested in Driscoll. Uh, I believe it's for the, um, the cafeteria. So by voting for the lower debt exclusion, people are not starving the public schools of Brookline of some uh, important capital improvement dollars. What this lower recommendation is emphasizing is the need for understanding the long term when making short term decisions. It's encouraging a proactive rather than a reactive approach. It's encouraging us to have calm versus panic as we address some very difficult decisions. Um, we, um, and I think finally, uh, whether you vote for the lower or the higher override amount, people need to understand that the amount of money that is going to be borrowed for the devotion project, whatever that total cost is, will be the same. It's just going to be impacting how much uh, remaining borrowing, borrowing capacity that the town will have. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Stanley and Cliff Brown, you're next. Thank you very much. Stanley Spiegel on Stetson Street, a town meeting member from Precinct 2. There's been a... I'm waiting for Mr. Chair to be done. Thank you. Thank you Sorry, very much. Stanley. Sorry. No, right ahead. Um, there's been a, a lot of speculation about numbers that you folks should put on, on the ballot, whether it be the lower override amount or the higher or maybe even a higher number yet that Dr. Lupini and the school committee may request. 
And I would hope that you put some kind of a pyramid approach uh, as well, maybe multiple numbers. But one number that I haven't heard discussed very much at all is another number that will be on the ballot no matter what other numbers you put on, and that's the number zero, as in a failed override. And that's a number that's accessible to the voters as well. I've heard talk about models and assumptions in the models that determine how much the override should be. But what I haven't heard much about are the assumptions in the models that relate the size of the override with its probability of passage. And I believe that's a very important number, a very important model to have in mind, and I don't know how much work has been done on it. Because the one number that I think we don't want is the number zero. And I believe, and I think it's obvious, that there's a relationship between the size of the override and its probability of passage or failure, which gets us to zero. I already know that there's opposition gearing up for this override. There will be questions such as, why should we have to pay more taxes to educate non-resident students whose own families pay their taxes elsewhere? And with regard to devotion, why should we have to pay more than we need to in order to fund the most expensive option, which not only is more expensive than the others, but is, takes longer to complete and is more disruptive to students? I'm not saying that these questions don't have reasonable and persuasive answers, but in a world of sound bites and slogans, they are tough to respond to, and they will have traction. And I would submit they'll have more traction with the, depending on the vigorousness of the opponents and the size of the override, which are related to each other. So I think that's a very important concern that you have. I mean, there are a couple of ways of deciding an override. Let's see what we need and then put that number out there to fund. Or let's see how much people can afford and then scale our needs in order to fit into what is achievable on the override ballot. And I haven't heard too much, although a little bit, but not much about that very important question, which to me I think should be central because you want to avoid zero. You already have revenue enhancements that will be coming, I assume, regardless of the override. Higher parking fees, um, um, a higher trash fee, and with a probability of even still higher if people can't fit all their trash in the, the bin and have to go through pay as you throw. These are expenses that people will have to deal with and that people may not feel happy about digging in even deeper into their pockets. So I would urge you as you decide what to put on the ballot, come up with a number that can be, that can be uh, approved by the voters that the schools can live with so that we don't get to zero. Because I think that's job one is avoiding zero and zero is an option that's on that ballot, whatever else you put. Thank you very much, good luck. Thank you, Stanley. Cliff Brown and then Regina Frawley. Uh, Cliff Brown, High Slop Road, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 14, and a uh, member of the Override Study Committee. Um, <clears throat> so last week I read an article in the Boston Business Journal that said that Brookline's pension fund now ranks among the worst funded in the state. It's pretty interesting. I wrote the author and challenged him about the single metric he used to make that assertion and pointed out that the flaws in the analysis of not only focusing on a single data point, but in really dissecting the information in front of him, or not dissecting the information in front of him. In my view, there have been many such slate of hand analyses used in the override discussion. One that I want to point out today, which was mentioned earlier by uh, a speaker, is the statement that spending per pupil has declined in Brookline over the past eight years, from $17,412 in 2004 to 16934 in 2014. Let me parenthetically say that I'm not sure per student spending really is a, a particularly important metric. It's really the value of the education. But since people are using this specific number and this specific point, it needs to be addressed. Like the reporter's simplistic analysis, 
which is looking at pension fund funded ratios. The statement on the surface is true. However, there is a rather large but in each situation. The reporter ignored the fact that we are constantly lowering our assumed rate of return and that we are managing to a full funding in 2030. Those practices make our funded ratio much lower than it would be if we took advantage of all the options uh, available to us to minimize our annual funding. He cherry-picked numbers and did not do an apples and apples comparison between us and other municipalities. In the per-pupil spending analysis, the analytical flaws and factual omissions are almost as egregious. The analysis fails to recognize the fact that in 2011, fiscal 2011, two events occurred that saved six and a half million dollars in expenses or a thousand, almost eleven hundred dollars per student. The events were entering the GIC and refinancing debt on school buildings that saved money on debt service. Those amounts that reduced payments, those amounts, those were amounts that reduced payments to insurers and bondholders not amounts that reduce services in the classrooms. As shown on the paper in front of you, the correct apples to apples comparison is that per pupil spending in Brookline has effectively increased in real terms over the past eight years. When the reporter wrote me back, he didn't answer the questions I posed to him or the challenges I made to his analysis. Instead, he found a word in my note and used it to raise another argument, in essence, to move the goalposts. That is sort of like requiring or suggesting a group use certain assumptions for an extended period of time and then say, never mind, let's use these instead. We all know that it is easy to use specific numbers to support an argument. Over the past year, there were a lot of questions asked and analyses performed that exposed flaws in many long expressed arguments in this town. Many other analyses were not completed because information was not forthcoming. Speaking for the majority, we made a clear effort to be intellectually and analytically rigorous and honest and to let the numbers speak for themselves, even when they said things we did not expect. That is a philosophy and approach that needs to be continued going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. Regina, who's uh, the last person I have signed up to speak. Good morning. I hadn't planned to speak. Uh, I'm Regina Frawley from Precinct uh, 16, town meeting member, and this year my 50th anniversary living in town. I now live in the home that was built by the Frawley family when Russet Road was merely a street with nothing on it. So going back to the 30s, it was platted in 29. I have some perspective. Um, and I remember how I was persuaded to buy the house from my in-laws because of the schools. And I was assured what the tax rate would be. And it averaged a certain amount every year, and indeed it did for a very long time, and then it didn't. Um, my daughter went to Brookline schools. Her father was the first matriculator of the Baker School after it was built. So with those perspectives, I now look at a very different demographic, a very different reality. I also look at a discussion that has so little institutional memory, and I don't mean the kind I just spoke to. Fifteen years ago, the comprehensive plan started in Brookline, and it ended in 2005. Uh, during the very first year, a ninth elementary school was discussed, and a specific property was posited as a as a place for that school, and we own it already. Um, I've already shared that information with the chair of the school committee in the past two weeks. Um, concurrently, a assumption in a community of goodwill of, with the, uh, at the risk of saying left wing, if you will, but we're very liberal. We, you can't name a social program we're not supporting. So that is just a given, and I don't know anybody called a conservative who would disagree with that. We care about people. We care about all people in this community. But the override has really only focused on the schools. And during the comprehensive plan, it focused heavily on increasing the number of units, habitable units in the town of Brookline. 
hence the discussion of a ninth elementary school. The only habitable, and I have always resented this because it was really not understood at the time, and in my family I understood it all the time because we earned our living through affordable housing. And that was the term affordable housing. And the only posited program was what was not acknowledged was 40B, and that's been, been the, the main um, program. So as we posited a policy of affordable housing, we were increasing the uh, units, 75% luxury or market rate. We were increasing the number of students. We were increasing the likelihood we had a program of 20 years. Every school had to be rehabbed, but in, that actually in reality meant they had to be expanded. The Baker School, I've been told by school department heads, that <laughs> the day it was finished, it was already obsolete. So where's the planning in all of this? Seniors are 40% in my precinct owning a single family house. They're on fixed incomes. In the whole discussion of the override, I don't hear anybody talking about the impact. If we are pushed out, and the figure that they've used for the override has been as even in excess of 14% when accrued with the, uh, over, uh, the original uh, ability for over 2.5% plus the override. Um, we're looking at pushing our seniors out on fixed incomes. We're, they're really, you now have fees. You have not only trash fees, which used to be in the taxes, you have sewer fees. I just used $64 worth of water. My bill was in excess of $200 because of all the fees, the sewer fees. None of it can be deducted from my taxes. There's no input here for the impact. If we sell our homes because we can't afford to live here, who are we gonna sell to? Young families with children. So it's just a circular problem and it required a more comprehensive understanding. And I haven't heard it discussed. We have been, the override has been a single variable and it's been discussed only from the point of view of expansions. It, at the risk of the cliche from uh, the movie, if you build it, they will come. And I wish we had had a more comprehensive discussion because there were alternatives to expanding Hancock Village. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. And uh, that's gonna conclude our hearing for, for this morning. I wanna thank everybody for their very intelligent and uh, cognitive input, and this, we're gonna consider everything that was said here tonight as we reach a decision about this very important issue about our future. Thank you. That's it.